Lucy Letby is accused of the murder of seven babies and the attempted murder of ten others. While she was working on the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital, Letby denies all of the charges over the incidents. Lucy Letby was the only person working on the night shift. It was alleged in court that their mother was apparently told by Miss Letby, trust me, I'm a nurse. This is a podcast about one of the most anticipated criminal trials for years. It involves the most shocking of allegations, the alleged murders and attempted murders of tiny, premature babies at the hands of a neonatal nurse whose very job it was to look after them. Lucy Letby is on trial at Manchester Crown Court, accused of killing seven infants and injuring ten more at the Countess of Chester Hospital in Cheshire. In total, there are 22 charges, all of which she denies. I'm Liz Hull, Northern Correspondent for the Mail, I will be in court to report on the case as it develops. And I'm Caroline Cheatham, a broadcast journalist. Every week on this podcast, we'll examine what's happened and bring you the details behind the headlines. This is the trial of Lucy Letby. The case against Lucy Letby is that she murdered or tried to kill 17 babies while she was working as a neonatal nurse at the Countess of Chester Hospital in the northwest of England. She denies the charges. The babies in this trial are not being named for legal reasons, and the identities of their families are also being protected. They're known only as babies A to Q. Seven of the babies died. Ten survived. Each one of these babies was or is someone's son or daughter and the mums, dads and families of every baby are present in court, listening to every detail of how their child was allegedly killed or harmed. We'll be bringing you that detail as the jury is hearing it from the prosecution and defence. We're getting behind the headlines to explain far more than the news reports you'll be reading, watching and listening to. And the importance of a fair trial is paramount, so we won't be getting into anything in this podcast that the jury have not been told, because they are the 12 people who have to decide the outcome of this case. The jury is now hearing about each baby in turn, and over the past few weeks, we focused each episode on each baby. We've already heard how six babies were allegedly killed or harmed by Lucy Letby over a six-week period in the summer of 2015. Today, we focus on the seventh baby in this case. Welcome to episode 9, Baby G, part 1. So Liz, like in the last episode, we're splitting this episode into two parts. And again, that's because of delays in the case, but also because of the nature of the allegations relating to Baby G. Yes, Caroline, we've lost several days because a juror fell ill, but... Also, Lucy Letby is accused of attempting to murder baby G three times, once on a night shift in September 2015 and twice on another day a fortnight later. The prosecution have split their case in two to help the jury understand the timings. Today, in part one, we'll explain what the prosecution say happened to baby G in the early hours of September the 7th. And next week, we'll explain what they say happened two weeks later on September the 21st. We'll also bring you more information from the defence and why they say Lucy Letby is not guilty of these attempted murders. Baby G is the most premature baby involved in this case. She weighed just one pound two ounces and her father said she was no bigger than his hand when she was born at the end of May 2015. She was actually born before all the other babies we've heard about so far, but because she was so premature... She was still on the neonatal unit in September, more than three months later. Yes, the jury have heard that baby G was an IVF baby. Her mother had been in and out of the Countess before her birth because of problems with her placenta that had caused her to bleed. When her waters started to leak at 23 weeks and six days, she was sent to Arrow Park Hospital on the Wirral, which is a specialist centre, in case the baby arrived. Not long after being admitted to Arrow Park, Baby G's mother complained to nurses that she had tummy ache. They thought it was a symptom of the drugs she was on to help speed up the development of the baby's lungs. They didn't realise labour had started. 
In a statement read to the court, Baby G's mother described the distressing moment her daughter was born while she was sitting on the toilet on the hospital ward. Her words are voiced by an actor. I was 23 weeks pregnant. My waters were leaking, so they sent me to Arrow Park Hospital, where they monitored me. It was on a Sunday, and I was complaining about a stomach ache. I went to the bathroom, and my daughter came out. The emergency bell didn't work, and nothing happened. No one came. So I was screaming and hitting the walls. Someone came, and I told them my daughter was only 23 to 24 weeks. They went for help, and everyone rushed in. I didn't know whether she was a girl or a boy at first, and when they said girl, I just said, save her. They were trying to calm me down and her down. She was only one pound, two ounces. Just a little tiny thing. The first doctor who rushed in to help baby G's mother was paediatrician Lara Bunny. She described scooping the tiny infant out of the water in the toilet bowl while she was still attached to her mother via the umbilical cord and wrapping her in a plastic bag to keep her warm. Baby G was described as being in a poor condition at birth. She needed ventilating immediately to help her breathe. She was so small that doctors gave her just a 5% chance of survival, and her mother was unable to hold her for the first seven weeks of her life. Baby G had many problems in the first few weeks, including chronic lung disease, kidney and bowel problems, infections, jaundice and high blood sugar. She also had a serious bleed on one of her lungs. The court heard that at least five times in those early days, her parents were warned that she wouldn't make it. But her mother also told the court that her daughter was a fighter, and by the time she was 13 weeks old, she'd overcome most of those problems. And doctors at Arrow Park believed she was well enough to be transferred to the Countess, closer to her parents' home. On the evening of August the 13th, an ambulance transferred baby G to Chester, where she was admitted to the neonatal unit. By then, she was what doctors class as full term, or 37 weeks old, and she weighed around four pounds. She was off her ventilator, but still receiving oxygen via small prongs up her nose, and was being fed her mother's expressed breast milk every three hours, either by her nasal tube or a bottle. And once at the Countess, she was admitted to nursery two, Now, that was the high dependency room, and she was doing well. That was until the night shift of September the 6th into the early hours of September the 7th, which is when the prosecution say Lucy Letby tried to kill her. And the evening of September the 6th is significant for two reasons, Caroline. Firstly, it was Lucy Letby's final night of a block of four night shifts, and this was the first block of night shifts she'd worked since the alleged attack on Baby F almost five weeks earlier. And secondly, it was significant because September the 6th was Baby G's 99th day of life and nurses were getting ready to help her parents celebrate her 100th day milestone the following day. They'd even put up a party banner near her cot and brought in a cake for them. But instead of it being a day of celebration, Baby G's 100th day ended up being a day of worry for her parents because shortly after 2am... On September the 7th, Baby G vomited violently and suddenly collapsed. Yes, and it's the prosecution case that this was because Lucy Letby sabotaged her care. They say she overfed Baby G with milk, then injected air into her stomach, causing her to stop breathing and become dangerously ill. So, Liz, let's outline what the prosecution say happened that night. Lucy Letby was on shift, as we've heard, but she wasn't Baby G's designated nurse. The court was told another nurse, who we can't name for legal reasons, was her designated nurse. She was looking after Baby G in Nursery 2, and another baby not involved in the case, in a different room. The unit was fairly quiet, with just seven babies being cared for in total and Lucy Letby had responsibility for a sicker baby in the intensive care room, Nursery One. Baby G's designated nurse told the court that her observations, that's her heart rate, her breathing rate and temperature, were all fine in the hours leading up to her collapse, and she'd been feeding well. So at two o'clock in the morning, she gave Baby G her usual 45 millilitres of expressed breast milk through her nose tube, 
which was the usual thing to do because she was asleep, and she took it without any problems. Soon afterwards, the nurse said she went on her hour-long break. And it was when she came back from that break that she realised there'd been a problem. Yes, the shift leader on duty that night, a nurse called Ailsa Simpson, told the jury that at about quarter past two, she was sitting at the nurse's station, directly opposite nursery two, when she heard Baby G vomit violently. She said the alarm monitoring Baby G sounded, and she and Lucy Letby ran immediately to help her. She told the jury it was a significant projectile vomit, which had gone out of Baby G's cot and onto the floor and a chair nearby. There was also sick on the bedsheets. Miss Simpson said she and Lucy Letby immediately sat Baby G up, but her heart rate and oxygen levels dropped dramatically, so they began giving her rescue breaths via a mask and called for help. Medical notes written by Lucy Letby later that morning also revealed that soon after she'd vomited, another 45 millilitres of milk, plus a quantity of air, was aspirated or drawn out of her stomach. Dr Alison Ventress, the registrar on duty, came urgently to review Baby G and she noted the large milky vomit and also that Baby G's stomach was purple and swollen and she was very distressed. Dr Ventress gave evidence in court and took the jury through her notes, which revealed she had planned to insert a cannula into Baby G to start her on some antibiotics. But before this could be done, she was called away to the operating theatre, which was next door, to help deliver another baby. An hour later, while Dr Ventress was still in theatre, Baby G deteriorated further. Dr Ventress told the court she was called out of theatre at around 3.20am when Baby G stopped breathing again and her heart rate crashed. The decision was made to move her to intensive care and Dr Stephen Breary, the on-call consultant, was asked to come in urgently. Dr Ventress decided to put Baby G onto a ventilator to help her breathe. She told the court that when she tried to insert the tube down Baby G's throat, she saw a small amount of bloody fluid coming from behind Baby G's vocal cords, which struck her as unusual. And this is significant because the prosecution say this is another example of Lucy Letby somehow assaulting Baby G as she did other alleged victims. The jury have heard that similar swelling was noted on Baby C's vocal cords before he was allegedly murdered and that Baby E also allegedly suffered a more brutal attack with a plastic tube or wire which caused the catastrophic bleeding before he too was killed. So Baby G was moved to the intensive care nursery, Nursery 1, and because her designated nurse was not qualified to look after such poorly babies, Lucy Letby was assigned to take over her care. That's right, Caroline. Lucy Letby took over the care of Baby G while her designated nurse called her parents at home to tell them what had happened, and they came straight to the unit. When they arrived, they were very shocked at their daughter's deterioration. Her mother told the court... I remember it was Lucy looking after her that day. We visited that day. The hospital then phoned to tell us she had vomited. We were told she was okay, but when we got there, she was in intensive care with all the machines. It was such a shock. She looked like she was going to die. And despite being on a ventilator to help her breathe, Baby G failed to improve and doctors struggled to stabilise her. She suffered another collapse at 5.30am and again at 6.05. Doctors were desperately trying to work out what was going on and even changed the ventilator in case it was faulty. Eventually they noticed thick mucus coming out of the breathing tube into her mouth and discovered a clot at the end of it, which they removed and then tried to stabilise her once more. Doctors also thought her abdomen appeared very large and they drew out a significant amount of air from her tummy. They were still trying to stabilise Baby G when Lucy let me clocked off for the night and went home, a little later than usual, at around 10am. Yes, and like we've seen in the other cases, later on that afternoon she began texting her friend and mentor, who we can't name for legal reasons, but who was on the day shift and had been designated to look after Baby G. The messages are read by actors and begin at 4.20pm, with Lucy let me asking her colleague, who was on her break, How are the parents? Devastated, but determined she'll get through, as always. Thought that if she got to 100, then they could feel confident she'd be fine. Awful, isn't it? We'd all been sat at desk at start of night, making banner. 
Mary brought her cake in. Right, best go back. See you shortly. Kiss, kiss. Soon afterwards, the messages begin again as they start discussing the doctor's plan to transfer Baby G back to Arrow Park. They begin with the nurse on duty messaging Lucy Letby. I come back and she's worse. Sad face emoji. Needs to go out. Too sick to move. Oh no. Yup, I know. Looks dreadful. Getting puffy. Any idea what's caused it? Nope. Just seems to be a circulatory collapse. Chest sounds clear. Hmm, what can cause that? Is it that she's an extreme prem who had long-term inotrope and vent dependency and now she's older and doing more for herself? It just takes a little bug or something to tip her over as no reserves and chronic lung, etc. We're going with sepsis and yes to no reserves. She looks grim. Later, Lucy Letby went into the hospital to fill in some paperwork from her previous night shift and she visited Baby G. At 11pm, she WhatsApped her friend again, who by now had also left work. She looks awful, doesn't she? Hope you get some sleep. Yeah. Going to Arrow Park Hospital. On triple antibiotics now, and a bit more stable. Yes, just left work. Last gas, 7.0. Lactate, 9. So no better. Damn. I have a bad feeling. At least they know Arrow Park. Not looking good, but yes, at least go into where she is known. Just hope they get her there. Hmm, not sure they will. On today of all days. Yup, poor parents. Yeah, she's declining bit by bit. Yup, need to try and switch off. I'll update you tomorrow. Kiss, 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 kiss. And later that night, in the early hours of September the 8th, Baby G was moved back to Arrow Park Hospital. So, as we said earlier, there have been a couple of significant delays in the case this week, so the jury have yet to hear in detail from the prosecution experts. But it's probably worth pointing out that in his opening statement at the beginning of the trial, prosecution barrister Nick Johnson Casey said both experts, so that's retired paediatrician Dr Dowie Evans and neonatologist Dr Sandy Bowen, were in agreement that someone gave baby G an excessive volume of milk and injected her with air, probably via her nose tube, around two o'clock in the morning. They both said that the fact that baby G had been fed 45 millilitres by her designated nurse around that time, vomited, then another 45 millilitres was aspirated from her stomach, proved there was a clear inconsistency between the amount of milk that had gone into baby G and the amount of milk that had come out. And both experts say this didn't happen by accident and that someone must have put extra milk and air into her stomach. But Lucy Letby denies harming baby G, and her defence barrister, Ben Myers Casey, insisted she was an extremely premature, high-risk baby. He suggested markers in her blood, which was tested periodically the day after her collapse, suggested she had an infection, and that this, not Lucy Letby, was the cause of her collapse. Under his cross-examination, Dr Ventress admitted as Lucy Letby and her colleague had discussed in their text messages, that they initially believed baby G's sudden deterioration was due to sepsis and that they had treated her with antibiotics accordingly. And it's not disputed that once at Arrow Park, baby G was treated for an infection. She stabilised and quickly made good progress. In fact, just over a week later, on September the 16th, she was well enough to return again to the Countess. And at that point, she weighed four pounds, 10 ounces. She was on very little medication and her parents were hopeful that it wouldn't be too long before she'd be allowed home. Their hopes, though, were short-lived because five days later, on September the 21st, which was the date she was originally due to be born, she fell ill again. The prosecution say Lucy Letby had tried to kill her for a second time. She's accused of attempting to murder baby G on two more occasions on that date. Those two allegations will be the focus of next week's episode, and we should stress again that Lucy Letby denies all the charges.
So this week, Liz, we've got a fantastic guest who knows the inside of a courtroom better than most. He's prosecuted some of the most serious criminals and gangs in some of the most high-profile cases in the country and put some of Britain's worst offenders behind bars for a very long time. We're joined by Nazir Afzal, the former Chief Crown Prosecutor for the North West. Thanks so much for doing this, Nazir. I suppose what we were hoping you might be able to shed some light on and give us a bit of an insight into is how much pressure is there for prosecutors when they end up with a big, serious case like this to compile the evidence, to get everything right? You've got to always have a back in your mind, remember, there's a jury there listening to this for the first time. And so you've got to present your case that will be relatively easily understandable at the same time as addressing all the issues that you have to address. So we start off on the basis, you know, the defendant is always in his proven guilty. That means the prosecution needs to prove guilt. That means that they have to reach a high standard, the threshold being people know it as beyond reasonable doubt, but actually Mm -hmm. it means that the jury have to be sure of the guilt of the individual on each count on the indictment. So you can't generalize it. And, and try and throw mud at somebody, you've got to be able to prove each count, each charge, in effect, to the high standard, and do so in such a way that the jury understands the evidence. At the same time, you've got to be able to rebut any defense argument. So if the defense is saying A, B, and C, you've got to have a response to A, B, and C. And all of that has to be done up front. I prosecuted the Stepping Hill Hospital allegation 11 years ago. That was an allegation against an individual who was a nurse. It took us, I think, something like two years to get to trial because we had to get all the expert evidence lined up. You've got to be able to prove that the deaths were unlawful and then prove that the person that we had charged and ultimately were convicted was responsible for that. Interesting you bring that up, Nazir, because I was chatting to another reporter that covered that trial in this current Lucy Letby trial, in order to try and simplify, which is a hell of a lot of complicated medical evidence, they've got iPads with lots and lots of documents online. They've each got their individual iPad. The police have done videos to show how you put a drip up, fly-throughs of the neonatal unit. Technology's moved on quite a bit. In the old days, you probably remember, that sometimes a jury was taken to the alleged scene of the crime. Mm. So Now you don't need to do that. You can show them. You can video it. You can use all sorts of technology to be able to show how something may have been done or may not have been done. Yeah, they are taking on a lot of complicated information. In a case like this, it's expert evidence that will be the most important evidence, I imagine. And experts are very good at speaking their academic type (laughs) language. Yes. But, you know, you and I don't understand a word of it. And so we've got to try and turn it into something that's readily accessible and that proves very challenging but the prosecution have to do it it's the responsibility of the prosecution to to go back to the technology nazir for someone who's sort of seen this over the passage of time is it is it a positive development absolutely i mean we can't push back and say well let's go back to paper and pen people now receive everything in digital ways so they expect to see that in the courtroom too So that's it for part one of episode nine. Next week, in part two, we'll hear that Lucy Letby is accused of attempting to murder baby G on two further occasions. I'll be in court to listen to the evidence and you can read my daily reports in the mail and on Mail Plus. You can also follow us on Twitter at Lucy Letby Trial or send us an email at thetrialofluciletby at gmail.com. And we'll both be back next week. See you then. Lucy Letby is accused of the murder of seven babies and the attempted murder of ten others while she was working on the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Letby denies all of the charges over the incidents. Lucy Letby was the only person working on the night shift. It was alleged in court that their mother was apparently told by Miss Letby, trust me, I'm a nurse. This is a podcast about one of the most anticipated criminal trials for years. It involves the most shocking of allegations. 
the alleged murders and attempted murders of tiny, premature babies at the hands of a neonatal nurse whose very job it was to look after them. Lucy Letby is on trial at Manchester Crown Court, accused of killing seven infants and injuring ten more at the Countess of Chester Hospital in Cheshire. In total, there are 22 charges, all of which she denies. I'm Liz Hull, Northern Correspondent for the Mail. I will be in court to report on the case as it develops. And I'm Caroline Cheatham, a broadcast journalist. Every week on this podcast, we'll examine what's happened and bring you the details behind the headlines. This is the trial of Lucy Letby. The case against Lucy Letby is that she murdered or tried to kill 17 babies while she was working as a neonatal nurse at the Countess of Chester Hospital in the northwest of England. She denies the charges. The babies in this trial are not being named for legal reasons, and the identities of their families are also being protected. They're known only as babies A to Q. Seven of the babies died. Ten survived. Each one of these babies was or is someone's son or daughter, and the mums, dads and families of every baby are present in court, listening to every detail of how their child was allegedly killed or harmed. We'll be bringing you that detail as the jury is hearing it from the prosecution and defence. We're getting behind the headlines to explain far more than the news reports you'll be reading, watching and listening to. And the importance of a fair trial is paramount, so we won't be getting into anything in this podcast that the jury have not been told, because they are the 12 people who have to decide the outcome of this case. The jury is now hearing about each baby in turn and over the past few weeks we've focused each episode on each baby. We've already heard how six babies were allegedly killed or harmed by Lucy Letby over a six-week period in the summer of 2015. And on the last episode we heard that Lucy Letby allegedly attempted to murder the seventh baby in this case, Baby G, in September the same year. Today, we'll hear that she allegedly tried to kill Baby G on two further occasions. Welcome to Episode 9, Baby G, Part 2. So Liz, we're on to the second part of Episode 9. Just remind listeners why we've split the episode into two. Well, it was for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because of delays in the case due to a juror being poorly with COVID. And secondly, because the alleged three attempted murders happened on two separate dates, two weeks apart. We've already heard that baby G is the most premature baby in this case. She was actually born in a hospital toilet when her mother went into labour unexpectedly 16 weeks early. We've heard that she was on the margins of survivability weighing a little over one pound when she was born at the end of May. That's right, Caroline, she was tiny, but she was a fighter and it's the prosecution case that she was stable and progressing well when Lucy Letby first tried to kill her on September the 7th. And this date is significant, Liz, because it was Baby G's 100th day of life, a massive milestone, and the nurses had put up a party banner and brought in a cake to celebrate. But before they had time to celebrate at all, Baby G collapsed. It's alleged that in the early hours of September the 7th, Lucy Letby overfed her with milk and also injected air into her stomach via her nose tube, causing her to vomit violently and stop breathing. She was so poorly that doctors at the Countess decided she needed to go to Arrow Park Hospital on the Wirral for more specialist care. And that's where we left it last week, Liz. Baby G had returned to Arrow Park. Yes, she was there for eight days and treated for an infection. And when she came back to the Countess, she was breathing for herself. So over the next few days, doctors treating Baby G thought that she was doing well. In fact, she was well enough to be nursed in Nursery 4. And that was where the least sick babies on the neonatal unit were cared for. And by September the 21st, doctors were preparing to give her her three-month vaccinations. And let's just explain why this date is another significant date for Baby G. So the jury have heard that September the 21st was actually Baby G's due date. That's the day she should have been born if she hadn't come early. 
Now, the court had heard that Lucy Letby was working a day shift on September the 21st, and she started the day as Baby G's designated nurse. That's right, Caroline. Lucy Letby had come on shift as usual around 7.30am. And jurors have heard that on this day the unit was busy. There was about 14 babies being looked after in total. Lucy Letby was responsible for Baby G in Nursery 4 and three other babies on the unit. So what did the prosecution say happened that morning? So the jury have been shown medical notes written by Lucy Letby. At around quarter past nine that morning, she fed Baby G her usual 40 millilitres of milk via the tube in her nose because she was asleep. Then, just over an hour later, Baby G vomited twice, stopped breathing for around 10 seconds and the oxygen levels in her blood dropped dangerously low. Her heart rate also surged and it was noted that she was pale and her tummy looked more swollen than normal. A junior doctor called Dr Peter Fielding, who was on his morning ward round, was called to review Baby G. But by the time he arrived a few minutes later, she appeared to have recovered without any need for help and had stabilised herself. And it's the prosecution case, Liz, that like she'd done a fortnight earlier on September the 7th, Lucy Letby caused this collapse by overfeeding Baby G and injecting air into her tummy. They say this is the second time she tried to kill her. After Baby G's collapse, doctors began trying to work out what had caused it. They stopped Baby G's milk feeds and ordered x-rays and blood tests. They also decided she needed intravenous fluids and antibiotics in case she had an infection. A decision was also made to try and move her to the intensive care room, Nursery 1, for one-to-one care and closer observation. And another nurse, who we can't name for legal reasons, became her designated nurse. But before she could be moved into Nursery 1, the doctors needed to insert a cannula into Baby G so they could get these fluids and medicines into her bloodstream. The court heard that several attempts were made by different doctors to find a suitable vein, but because she'd been so poorly and previously had lots of treatment, this proved tricky. Eventually, the most senior doctor in charge, that's consultant paediatrician Dr John Gibbs, and another registrar, Dr David Harkness, were both called to help. They arrived in Nursery 4 shortly before Hoppers 3, and because there were at least two more babies in cots in the same room... A portable privacy screen was put up around Baby G while they carried out the difficult procedure. Jurors were told they eventually managed to get the cannula into Baby G's left foot at the seventh attempt. Baby G's mum left the nursery while this was going on. Baby G's designated nurse also went out because she was looking after another baby elsewhere and the doctors left the room once the cannula had been inserted. Moments later, Lucy Letby, who was looking after at least two other babies in the same room, was calling for help after baby G collapsed again. Baby G's designated nurse gave evidence that she was called back into Nursery 4 by Lucy Letby. She said as she got to the door, she saw Lucy Letby beside baby G, giving her rescue breaths with a mask because her oxygen levels had dropped again. The privacy screen was still up but she said a machine, which was supposed to monitor Baby G's heart rate and oxygen levels, was off. This was not normal protocol, she told the court. She said, Lucy Letby said Baby G wasn't breathing. I could see she wasn't. She didn't look well at all. She was a pale colour. She wasn't moving. The monitor wasn't on. The actual physical screen was off. It was a black screen, which meant it was off. Liz, it's the prosecution case that Lucy Letby turned off the monitor before attacking Baby G and sabotaging her care for a third time. But when Baby G's designated nurse gave evidence in court last week, she told the jury that she didn't think Lucy Letby could have been the person who turned the machine off. And why did she say she'd come to that conclusion? She said that after Baby G collapsed, Dr Gibbs and Dr Harkness had come to see her in the corridor. She said they apologised for leaving Baby G behind the screen after they finished inserting the cannula and for not switching the monitor back on. Ben Myers, KC, Lucy Letby's barrister, questioned the nurse about this and suggested that Lucy Letby had been cross that Baby G had been left like this and urged her to report it to management. The nurse said she had no recollection of talking to Lucy Letby about it 
although she did admit she was so concerned that she had reported the matter to the neonatal unit manager, Erian Powell. But neither Mrs Powell, Dr Gibbs or Dr Hartness could remember talking to the nurse about the monitor. That's right, Caroline. Dr Gibbs said he couldn't remember if the monitor had been detached from baby G, but insisted it was not his usual practice to do this. Dr Harkness also said it was highly unlikely that he would have turned off the machine. But Dr Gibbs accepted that if the nurse remembered he and Dr Harkness apologising for forgetting to put the monitor back on, then presumably that's what happened. Mr Myers also asked Dr Gibbs whether he might have left the baby if he was very busy and stretched across different parts of the hospital, or if he had to leave in a rush, for instance. Again, the paediatrician said that that may be a reason, but he couldn't remember it happening. He also insisted he would not have left baby G if she had not been stable. So after this collapse at half past three, baby G was moved back into the intensive care room in nursery one, where she was put on oxygen support and kept under close observation. And at around 7.30pm that night, Lucy let be clocked off work. So Liz, we've heard a lot from the prosecution about these final two attempted murder allegations, but why do the defence say Lucy Letby was not responsible? As we heard in last week's episode, Mr Myers said baby G had a lot of problems because she was so premature. He pointed out that when she came back to the Countess, she'd been diagnosed with reflux, which is a common problem which causes babies to bring up their milk. Mr Myers described baby G as being prone to vomiting, and displaying frequent drops in her oxygen levels. The doctors who treated her agreed that she did have some vomiting episodes, but they insisted the only two instances of projectile vomiting were noted on the days when Lucy Letby allegedly attacked her. Mr Myers also suggested that baby G could have had an infection on September the 21st, or the stress of the repeated attempts to cannulate her could have been responsible for her collapse. That's right, Caroline, and Dr Gibbs agreed that this was a possibility, although the court also heard no markers for infection were found in her blood at that time. So after baby G's collapse on September the 21st, she recovered and remained in the neonatal unit at the Countess for several more weeks. On November the 2nd, when she was 156 days old, she was finally well enough to go home. Yes, but jurors have heard that it wasn't until she had a scan aged 15 months that the full extent of the damage to her brain was revealed. Now age seven, baby G has spent repeated periods in hospital and is still under the care of doctors at the Countess. She has been diagnosed with a serious form of cerebral palsy, which has left her with life-limiting problems. She's unlikely to ever walk, is visually impaired, is fed through a peg into her tummy, and needs round-the-clock care from her parents. Her father told jurors that after she was allegedly attacked, she seemed different and didn't respond to my voice anymore. We do not know what her life expectancy is. Last week, we heard from former Chief Prosecutor for the northwest of England, Nazir Afzal, In part two of his interview today, he tells us why court trials should be live-streamed. One way of tackling public confidence or lack of public confidence, Mm -hmm. well, there's only one way, really, it's transparency. If you shine a light on something, you get to see what it's like. And also, people do change their behaviours. You know, the the public gallery, you'll find generally they're empty in most cases, the vast majority of the time. People can't be bothered or can't afford to go into town to watch it. And yet the court is meant to be public. It's mm-hmm. meant to be open to you. And it would demystify it, wouldn't it? You know, unless, unless you're involved in a case, most people, most ordinary people don't set foot in a courtroom unless they get called for jury service. And there is a bit of, I don't know, you see witnesses come and give evidence who look absolutely terrified because they've no idea yeah. what to expect. Lawyers and judges don't like the idea of streaming. I wonder why, hey? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, the point is, they are operating, being paid for by you, the taxpayer. And therefore, we the taxpayers should see what's being done in our name. You know, there used to be that saying, justice should be seen. It's a no-brainer for me. You know, I've already had conversations with the Labour Party on this, because they're preparing their manifesto, if there is going to be an election in a year or two. And, you know, I said to them, 
the one thing that would make the biggest difference to the public's view of justice and make it as accessible as possible would be to allow streaming. It has to be subject to protections, but in the main, the most important thing you could do to make the justice system belong to us would be to allow us to see it. So what's Sakir's view on that, Nazir? Are you going to give us a scoop? I haven't spoken to Sakir about it, but I've spoken to his team, and they are very open Mm. to Mm. considering it. You and I don't have to watch it, but the fact that it's there Mm. will do such a big difference. You know, judges will have to speed things up. Judges will have to stop allowing things from drifting. Lawyers will have to tighten up their examination and their preparation of cases. One of the dangers people say is, oh, witnesses will will be playing to the camera. You know, the point is, if it's in the corner of a room, Mm. like a webcam, Mm. you don't even know it's there. You forget it's there. And the use of these new CVP links in COVID, it just proved that the technology is possible. We should have, you know, in effect, digital courts. We should allow people to see what's going on. You should be allowed to give evidence from your bedroom or from your workplace. It normalises it, doesn't it, as well, then, I suppose? There are all sorts of answers to all of the questions that people pose. Part of the reason for the podcast, obviously we're pushing a few legal boundaries, I suppose, by covering an ongoing trial on a podcast, but we felt it was important because of exactly what you just said around giving witnesses a voice, giving victims a voice, giving the process a voice, because you've got that thing with a long trial where we media go into the beginning opening statement, rock up a couple of times in the middle and then come for the defence and then at the end. And and actually the detail of the process is lost. The Americans have got this. The default is that all cases will be visible. Thank you for your time. That was absolutely fascinating. Thanks so much. Perfect. You're welcome, both of you. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, thanks so much, Nazir. So that's it for episode nine. The court is now on a three-week break for Christmas which means the jury won't be hearing any more evidence until January the 9th. So we've got a few weeks off, Caroline, but hopefully we'll be back in the first week of January to bring you a special guest episode. See you then.